Hey, Pre-Sales Collective, it's your host, James Kakis. And today I'm going to be joined by Andrew Birnbaum, Vice President of Solutions Engineering at Salonis. The topic of today's episode is solutions role in champion building. Andrew and the Salonis team do a great job in being true co-pilots and strategic drivers in accounts. How do they do that? Well, the SCs play a major role in champion building. And so in today's episode, we're going to talk about champion building and why and how SCs should play this role within an account. We'll talk about identifying a champion, developing a champion, and even testing a champion and talking about concepts of the personal win. Today's episode is a fantastic one, regardless of what level of solutions professional you are, because this concept is so important as it relates to being a driver and being a co-pilot in the sales process. Enjoy. Today's episode is sponsored by Consensus. Scale your pre-sales organization and deliver better experiences with intelligent demo automation. Experience an interactive video demo at goconsensus.com. Hi there, my name is Yuji Higashi, co-founder of Pre-Sales Collective, and I have big news to share with you if you're a pre-sales leader or an individual contributor early in your career. We recently launched two training and enablement programs aimed at helping you take your career to the next level. Both programs were created by pre-sales leaders with input from dozens of SC veterans across our community. Now we'll be running cohorts each month. So if you're interested in participating, visit us at presalescollective.com slash enablement to submit an inquiry and we'll send you details about each program, including this curriculum and schedule. We look forward to working with you on growing your career and being part of your career journey. Thank you. And I hope to see you soon. Andrew, welcome to the Pre-Sales Podcast. How are you? James, thanks for having me on. How are you doing? I'm great. I'm glad to have you on the podcast. We've been talking about having this episode for the last couple of months. And so it's great to have you on here. You've been a busy man. Salonis has been extremely busy, growing like crazy, and even just took a massive round of funding. Tell me about that experience. Yeah. I mean, so the company continues to grow about 100% year over year, and we're continuing to execute against our plan. For those of you that maybe didn't see the news, we just announced a $13 billion valuation, taking on $400 million worth of equity from QIA and another series of investors, and also getting a $600 million infusion for a revolving credit facility. So essentially, you know, the idea behind this round is to put us in a well-capitalized position heading into what many people are saying is an economic storm. But obviously with the decreased valuations that you see across the board within tech, it puts us in a very advantageous position to be fairly aggressive with acquisitions, assuming that the product fits into our platform and where we want to go. And also in order to increase our go-to-market organization as well as our product and engineering organization. So the growth has been palpable. You know, it's been five and a half years since I've been here. When I joined, it was about a $7 million perpetual revenue company. We're continuing to grow like crazy. And We're excited to see what the future has in store for us. I love your journey and I love the growth that the company has been through. So let's actually talk about that. Talk to us about your pre-sales career journey. What got you to where you are today? Yeah, I think I'm not alone in terms of people listening on this podcast to say, I had no idea what pre-sales was until I got into the business. So I've always kind of admired technology, right? And I've kind of considered myself to be a bit of a futurist. I arrived in pre-sales in a very circuitous and unexpected way. So I wasn't a computer scientist, didn't have an engineering background, got an economics degree. And when I started after college, I actually worked in the consulting world. And so for the first four years, I was really focused on streamlining supply chain operations at healthcare clients. Now, this work was really heavily driven through process orientation, and that becomes relevant into why I actually moved into Salonis here in a bit. But as I was doing research, I kind of thought to myself, there has to be a better way of executing these Six Sigma process improvement type of projects. And I was very fortunate at the time to kind of stumble across this new discipline of process mining and find out that the leader in the space, which was Salonis and still is today, uh, had just opened up their first U.S. office in New York City, which was where I lived at the time. Now, when I looked at the company and the mission really struck home for me because, and by the way, it still does today, because improving processes was what I was already doing. It was something that I was well-trained on. And I believe that there's a huge opportunity for disruption. When I spoke to the founder and the hiring manager, I knew I wanted to join, but the only role that was actually available at the time and that I was even remotely qualified for was pre-sales. Literally knew nothing, and I mean nothing about the SE role. (laughs) And it wasn't a role on my radar, right? Colleges don't teach you a course on how to be a solution engineer. But I thought it was one of those rare opportunities when I kind of looked at the company, the mission, the people that were engaged, what I thought the growth potential was, and decided that this was something that I wanted to be a part of. And it was one of those rare moments in life where I think you have a a very clear choice you need to make. It's right. 
do I become the disruptor or I, do I be the disrupted? And I think for me, the answer was obvious, which was I wanted to be part of that disruptor. What I didn't realize when I joined was that it was going to end up being one of the best paths that I've ever gone on in my life and that I was actually pretty good at this role. So when I joined in 2017, I think I was like higher number 18 or like 18 or 20 or something like that. So I was one of the first handful of people within the organization in the U.S. and just immediately fell in love with the startup environment. So previously I was working more in healthcare consulting, which compared to a startup environment is moving at a sales pace. And so the pace at which everything moved and also the meritocracy, right? The ability to kind of have good ideas and have influence on the direction and growth of the company really spoke to me. You know, I started as an IC, became really enamored with this idea of going on the most challenging accounts, pioneering new ideas and frontiers and opportunities within different industries and markets. And that sort of drive to pioneer and innovate is really what's kind of propelled me throughout my SE career. So after about two years of being an IC, I was asked by the founders to move to San Francisco and help lead the build out of our West Coast practice. Now, you have to understand at the time, we were still a very small company. We had no customers, no employees, no office. That was it, right? It was like, it was your classic like Silicon Valley story, like working out of a garage. And quite literally, I did interviews out of my apartment and had the initial wow. team work out of my apartment for the first handful of months. And I'll spare you all wow. the details and I'll fast forward a little bit. But about three years later, we had about a team of eight SE supporting a team of 20 AEs. And we had built out a multi tens of million dollar book of business. So it was rapid growth. We became the fastest growing group and region within the company. And then once I had uh, taken that team to new heights, moving from an immaterial offshoot to something tangible, I was asked to take on more of a North American role. And that's where I am today. I love the journey. I love the perspective. You got to live the working from your apartment type life. And now look, you're working for a company with a $14 billion evaluation after five and a half years. I mean, it's pretty incredible, man. Yeah. I always make a joke that my wife was the first office manager in San Francisco. I love that. So we're going to talk about what's made you so successful and your team so successful in today's topic of solutions, role, and champion building. Some of the things that we're talking about a little bit more here on the podcast is what our role should be in sales, what it shouldn't be as well. So I'm just curious, from your perspective at Solonis, what is the role of the solutions consultant? We actually call them sales engineers, solution engineers. Obviously, there's many different names to the role, solution consultant, sales engineer, solution architect. Each SE organization is going to have their idiosyncrasies and nuances, which are unique to their business. But what I always like to say is that SEs are more or less the Swiss army knife of the go-to-market organization. If I think about our top SEs and the qualities and characteristics that they have, they have great sales acumen, they have strong business knowledge, they have technical know-how, and to some extent, and most importantly, they have great EQ. So effectively, when you kind of pull all that together, they're sitting at the intersection of sales, consulting, and products. So it's really intended for people that are very dynamic and agile in the way that they work. Now, because we're part of the go-to-market organization, we're measured on revenue that we influence. This is, of course, our core focus here at Salona. So everything we do is ultimately tied to the revenue that we influence and the revenue that we drive, including the way that our people are comped, which we'll talk about hopefully a little bit later, we'll get to that and how that impacts champion building. But above all else, right, if I were to describe the role of an SE, what you really need to do is you need to develop a deep understanding of an organization's challenges. You need to use technology to create innovative solutions to solve these pain points. And you have to make complex topics extremely simple. And if you do all of that very well, you can turn detractors and skeptics into champions. As we talk about champion building, there are probably people on this podcast who are not necessarily in the pre-sales world yet, and they're not sure what champion building is. There's also some people who've been in technology for a long time who say, I have a definition of what champion building means. But what does it mean to you, Andrew? I've only been in the SC role for five years, but I think one of the most impactful statements I ever heard from one of my sales peers and sales leaders was he told me, if you don't have a champion in a sales cycle, you need to stop everything you're doing immediately. So before I start talking about champion building, I think it's really important to define like what is a champion and what is the role that they play. So in essence, a champion is someone within the organization that has cachet that you're working with who can sell on your behalf. And I think the important thing is not only are they selling on your behalf, but they're selling on your behalf when you're not there behind closed doors. And no deal is going to get done without a champion, quite literally zero. A deal has never been won without a champion in the organization that's advocating for you. They're actively feeding you intel. They have a personal win in the manner. They're helping you navigate the complexity of the organizations, and they're ultimately your advocate. So that's essentially how I think of a champion. And that's how I would define a champion. But let's talk about the act of champion building. So I think there's really three key steps in champion building. 
The first is identifying who the champion is. The second is then developing that champion. And then the third, and I think the one that is most often left out, is actually testing the champion continuously. And each of these categories are critical to the success of a sales cycle. So when you identify the right person, you need to ensure that they have the right motivation and the right behaviors. And you're looking for tells here, right? Is this person vocal? Are they upwardly mobile? Do they have the right role and profile? Do they take a keen interest in your product? Do they have a compelling need and a personal win associated with you getting that deal? Further, the ideal champion is established, they're powerful, they're well-connected. So I often see people, right, they try to make the champion within an organization someone that's only been there for two months. But the challenge with that is that person doesn't understand the nuances and complexities of how to get software or whatever you're trying to sell into that organization executed through their buying process. And I think that's a very, very important piece is they're able to influence others. Andrew, that was so well articulated. I took a bunch of notes there because I have multiple questions I want to ask you on that. That was really, really well said. To start, you mentioned the quote, if you don't have a champion in a deal, stop immediately. You know, I think a lot of times we rely on our sales peers to own that relationship with a champion. But what about the SCs owning that relationship with the champion? Is it multiple champions? Is it a single champion? Tell me your perspective there. I think that you always have to be multi-threaded. So there's always the champion that the AE is going to have and be trying to develop. And I think the SE should always have a relationship with that individual. And by the way, there's no clear definition of how to successfully define that someone is your champion or not. But generally, the rule of thumb that I use is, can I call this person at 8 o'clock on a Friday and get an answer from them? Can I text them at 11? And maybe they answer that night, but maybe they answer at 6 a.m. the next morning. But either way, they're answering my question. They're actively engaged. And so what I would tell you is that the SE has a really critical role within this because we need to be empowered, especially because we are participants in revenue generation, to actively shape, mold, and define the strategy within an account. It could be someone within the business that you're developing as a champion. It could be someone within IT, right? Maybe you have to get through technical hurdles or you need to understand what an info security process, or it could be a SME within a specific area. Any of those types of categories are relevant, but my opinion is it's always best to go wide and deep because at the end of the day, I've seen it time and time again. I'm sure many of the people on the podcast have seen it. You could be executing a flawless sales cycle. You lose that one person that's your advocate, the sales cycle stops in its tracks. So being multi-threaded and wide is incredibly important. One of the things that you mentioned earlier was the concept of personal win. I always reflect back on experience early on in my tech career, working with our VP of partnerships. And one of the things that he said was, James, you need to figure out how these people are comped. You need to figure out how they go home to see their families at night and where their personal win is at all times. And that has always resonated with me. Can you talk a little bit more about the solutions consultants role in champion building as it relates to the personal win? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think at the end of the day, when you think about a personal win, every single person is driven by some sort of internal motivation. It could be that they're trying to be upwardly mobile within an organization. They're trying to get that promotion. It could be that they're trying to be seen as a change maker. It could be that they just want to do their job better and more effectively, and they want to drive Mm -hmm. transformation within a business. But I think at the end of the day, when you think about building a champion, what's interesting is that it's not just a professional skill set. It's actually a life skill set. You need to be able to build trust. And at the end of the day, that's really about understanding pain, consistently asking the right questions at the right time in the sales process. And I think the number one takeaway that I would give to you is when you think about building a champion, especially for an SE perspective, like the best way to build a champion is to make them look good in front of others. So that for us means preparing really well for a demo. It means being extremely crisp on what the value proposition is. It means testing them and ensuring that they can regurgitate or retort back to you exactly how your solution fits the problem that that business is facing. And so I think that that's the number one responsibility of the SE is, first of all, showing up, performing through good Mm -hmm. preparation. I'm curious, Andrew, there are companies out there who don't believe that the SC should play a role in champion building, or they kind of stay in their lane. But what I've heard from you and what I've known about your experience at Salonis is that you talked about that you're a real strategic partner in revenue generation. So what should the solutions role be in the champion building and the go-to-market motion generally? Uh, I think you can tell from my prior comments that I believe the SEs have a massive role to play, right? I don't want us to be the passenger. I want us to be actively co-pilots in a sales cycle. SEs have a very active role at Salonis within champion building. And one of the corporate values that we have is that the best team wins. And I think that we all have to remember that when a customer makes a purchase from your organization, they're buying your product just as much as they are showcasing confidence and trust in your people. 
So for the SC specifically, we need to be viewed as that trusted advisor. In many cases, we already are, but I think the onus is upon us to really drive that trusted advisor status and give guidance to the organization on what is the best path forward? How do we essentially navigate obstacles? How are we different in terms of our solution versus a competitor? Now, despite being in the go-to-market motion, we are really sort of this unbiased truth teller. And that has to be used to our advantage, like I just said. So what is essentially the role that we should play in developing champions? I think at the end of the day, within Salonis, I expect each SC to truly own the account that they cover. They need to do the proper research. I'm a fiend for reading annual reports, earning releases, analyst days. I never go into a meeting, high stakes meetings especially, without having done the proper research. So you need to really know the people you're meeting with inside and out and where they sit within the organization and what those internal motivations are. Now, if you're speaking with a high level executive, the answer is actually already for the test are already out there. It's called the DEF 14A. It actually tells you how the top five officers in a company are compensated. You should take a look at it if you're not doing that already. But I think at the end of the day, the SC needs to be just as fluent and dynamic as an A. And the reason I say that is because a firm understanding of the business is going to allow for better discovery. And that really allows us to thread the needle going back to the personal win of what we talked about earlier to dovetail into their broader corporate strategies because these corporate strategies trickle down, right? It starts with the executive team. They develop the strategy from strategy to execution and everywhere in between. There are certain incentives and objectives that are layered in to hit those higher level goals. I also think that it's incumbent upon SEs to use proof stage activities as a medium to develop champions. One very simple activity that I always encourage my SEs to do is to just exchange numbers with a technical leader or SME. Most basic, yeah. simple ask doesn't require any effort, but you'd be surprised about how much intel that you can gather just from doing that. And I always ask them, find something simple to ask them. Say, hey, on our call today, you mentioned that your info security process required X, Y, and Z. Would it be possible to speak to the person responsible for this area, right? So now the SE is really engaged and involved in not only developing the champion, being active in the account, but also trying to navigate what might be the blockers to getting the deal done in the timeline that mm -hmm. we want. One of the questions is, well, from an AE perspective, why would they want an SC to be doing this? And the answer is simple. It helps us triangulate what is truth within an account. Of course, we always want to trust our champions. But if you have multiple people telling you that this is the path forward versus one, you could usually be a lot more confident that you're heading down the right path. The last thing I would just kind of tell you in terms of the role that I see the SC is playing and how to do it is we can use critical milestones and activities as an opportunity to build rapport. So as an example, Within Salonis, we deliver what are called solution blueprints prior to kicking off proof activities. This is a short presentation, essentially encapsulates what we learned in discovery, what we intend to solve for, and how we're going to go about doing it. And it's really used to drive that mutual buy-in from both parties. And we actually use this as a collaborative exercise. So we don't just come in, go into our box, and we present it back to the organization. We invite the stakeholders and the champions that we're working with to actually adjust, make texture changes, infuse their verbiage and their language into the deliverable so it becomes a shared asset that we're both presenting to their executive leadership team. And I think that ultimately is how you build trust and obviously progress an opportunity. I would stop the podcast right now if I could. That was a fantastic answer in terms of how you build true partnership, true value, and then help drive strategy, not only internally, but externally. And one of the things that you mentioned earlier that I want to ask you about is compensation. You had mentioned that there's ways that you utilize compensation and variable to help drive this type of behavior. Can you explain what that means? Yeah. So when I think about the SC team at Salonis, we've really made champion building part of our DNA. And so maybe in addition to kind of telling you about the variable compensation side, what I can also tell you about is programmatically and structurally have we designed our SE team so that they are incentivized both implicitly and explicitly to actually go and build champions. First of all, variable compensation. I think this is obviously one of the tools in the toolkit that every SE leader has to drive the right behaviors of our people. And the idea that we have behind our compensation is that we want to incentivize SE empowerment and then ultimately maximize the influence in a deal. What I tend to see in the market is that it's usually very team ACV based, and there's definitely a component of that with what we do at Salonis. But we put more of an emphasis on eat what you kill. So actually being a little bit more aggressive in our compensation plan, it's a little bit of a feast or famine mentality, but what that drives is sort of a mentality change. And this means that the SEs are strategically incentivized to even go further to grow the deal and have extra skin in the game. Now, in addition to this, right, we also have built sort of a programmatic approach to incorporating SEs into deal reviews and forecasting. So again, from an accountability mm -hmm. and empowerment perspective, mm -hmm our leadership team is actually conducting these weekly forecast calls that are then used by our CRO and our president of sales to identify inconsistencies across Salesforce casting. 
So that means that every single SE manager and SC is expected to be in the deals because if you're not, it's going to show in the, in the forecast calls. They need to know the use cases. They need to understand the business value and they need to identify what the risks are. That really helps us put an SC on par with an AE in terms of level of accountability, level of ownership. So it's sort of a, a mutual approach into how we attack accounts. And there's some other examples structurally into what we do. Like I'll give you another example. We started developing this idea of critical success factors to actually track champion development. Mm -hmm. So you can think of this as like an OKR. People aren't compensated on it necessarily, but there are tailored plans for each SE. And they're ultimately looking to track the input behaviors that we believe are going to lead to a successful output. We do this on a quarterly basis. And this can include, in addition to like number of champions built, can be discovery workshops executed, number of innovations submitted, number of amount of pipeline influence. So mm -hmm. while the SEs, again, aren't compensated on achievement of those tasks, it actually does create a very clear North Star that the SEICs can follow in alignment to what the SE leadership team wants them to focus on. I could ask you a million questions about SCs and forecasting. I love the topic and I love the perspective. So let me ask you this though, as it relates to up-leveling and enabling your team to understand how to build champions within their accounts, it sounds like the DNA that you have of a solutions engineer, solutions consultant at Solonis has this business acumen built in. So how are you enabling and training and up-leveling your organization, especially for those who may be coming from the outside where the SC role was different in terms of what they were responsible for? Yeah, it's a very interesting question. You know, honestly speaking, we don't have a formal practice and maybe we should, we should look into building this, but we don't have a formal practice or a training program in which we really walk someone A through Z on how to build a champion. I think the most impactful thing, if you're an SE leader, is of course to lead from the front. We expect every single one of our SE managers to be engaged on an account. And then another great leader that I once worked with told me, if you want to train someone to do something, there's a very clear cycle of behavior. It's show, tell, observe feedback. And so if the manager is involved in a deal, they can continue to show the person how you build a champion by asking simple questions, exchanging numbers, challenging them, being collaborative. And then they can actually observe that person do it the first time, the second time, the third time. So it's very experiential in the way that we approach it as opposed to more academic in nature. And I would also kind of tell you that our proof motions, because we are an emerging technology, are sort of inherently designed in a way where the SE is extremely critical to the outcome. Like this is not we throw up a demo and it's like we click around, we kind of customize a couple of logos and it's done. These are very intensive time intensive and resource intensive efforts because we're actually taking the customer's data and we're showcasing it back to them. So an SC during that proof motion, which could last four to six weeks, is handling everything from like initial discovery to executive alignment, mm -hmm. IT architecture reviews, operating model discussions, data integration analysis, value engineering. So we have this very wide swath of responsibilities. At the end of the day, what that essentially forces them to do is be the star of the show. So they're sort yeah. of the center stage they have to show the sales acumen. They have to show the technical underpinnings. Mm -hmm. They have to understand the business know-how and develop the relationships and trusts along the way. This part is central to SC champion building. And it really goes back to the overall theme that I keep on mentioning, which is empower the SEs to really be involved. I don't think that champion building necessarily needs to be something that is so structurally defined, but it's just those little extra mile inputs and practices that you can execute against to really drive an opportunity forward or really collect whatever intel that you need in order to affect the outcome. And again, I think this is really all about creating that DNA, that fabric, as opposed to yeah. explicitly telling people that they need to go and create champions. Absolutely. And I like the lead by example, lead from the front, and also it creates a bit of a copycat model, right? If you're an SC and you see your peers doing things and doing things really well, you, you obviously want to emulate that success. Do you have a favorite story or a favorite example of where your SC just went above and beyond in champion building and closed, you know, a really pivotal or integral deal? You know, I think maybe instead of going through one example, maybe I can actually give you a better sense of what are the types of behaviors and outcomes you can expect to see when you have a strong champion. And I think it's really, really important to note, right? Having a champion doesn't showcase itself until you hit rough water in a sales cycle or you need to call in a favor. So when things are going swimmingly, the champion is obviously sort of giving you that extra lift, but it's really when everything turns that you really start to see. I think Warren Buffett once said, when the tide goes out, you see who's swimming naked. And so let's kind of talk about how we change the tide by developing champions. One of the most dirtiest words for me in pre-sales is bake-off. I hate this word because it's extremely time-intensive. 
it's usually a mandate in terms of their evaluation process. But generally speaking, when you go into a bake-off, more often than not, an organization actually knows who they want to select, but you're going through the motions. So you're trying to kind of assess, are you in the inside track or are you cannon fodder for the competition? And so I can give you a very concrete example. So two years ago, we were in the final stages of pursuing what I would call my great white whale. Like every SC has one, right? The one that you've been chasing forever and it's extremely hard to get. It's like, <laughs> you're always at war with it. And this happens to be one of the largest banks in the US. It was a multi-year pursuit and it was the most challenging sales cycle I'd ever encountered. We executed two proof of concepts. There were countless late nights. We were on the road for weeks at a time an array of info security approvals and tests. So I think the team was just exhausted at this point and we had really poured everything we had into it. And as we started nearing the finish line, we were informed that our business champion had actually missed a critical step. And it's like, well, how does that happen? Well, this is the thing, right? In one of these enormous organizations, when you're talking about a $100 billion revenue organization, even your champion may not know all of the actual steps that are required to get a software on board, even if they've done it before, because the thresholds might be different. The type of classification for data privacy might be different, right? All There's all these different factors. So all the work we had essentially done up to that point, we were being told, was not sanctioned by procurement. And therefore, they would need to conduct a bake-off with an estimated time of completion of six months. Now, that was a problem because our fiscal year was ending in two. So we, we had to get this done. Now, the fortunate thing is, and obviously bringing it back around to champion building is, over those two years, we had really developed and tested our champions, and they were very high level. So some of the folks we regularly held calls with were SVP level and group CIO level of one of the banking divisions. When we found this out, we worked together to really understand what were the restrictions. And what we uncovered from the procurement team is that there was a way around this. It was just that the company EVP would have to overrule the process, and there had to be a clear business justification in doing so. Now, understanding the win for your champion is also critical, as I said earlier. So effectively, what we were able to do, and we knew because of the conversations we had, this company had just announced a multi-billion dollar cost takeout initiative. So what we did is we worked with our stakeholders, our champions, and we actually drafted a memo to the EVP, co-sponsored by the SVP and the CIO. We sent it out. He granted approval. A month later, we were inking the deal. So that's just an example of how a champion can really completely change the texture when you hit rough yeah. water. And then I think another shorter example that I would say is RFPs oftentimes unavoidable. It's just a part of being a pre-sales professional. But in my perspective, the best time to win an RFP is not during the response. If you're trying to win an RFP at the response, you've kind of already lost. You want to influence the RFP before it's even created. So you want to essentially structure the RFP in a way where it's your value proposition that ultimately everyone else is having to answer for. And so I've seen countless examples of our SEs influencing actually the structure and content of RFPs by using the detailed discovery and that credibility and trust to ensure that when they actually sent out the RFP for bid, it really was ticking all the features that make us unique. And so everyone else was required to solve the pain and up-level to the features that we provide. And everything was sort of done in a way that was really addressing the pain that we had uncovered during the initial discovery. And so, you know, we can just hand an champion RFX template. And what we usually yeah. get back is more or less the same template with some slight modifications. And there's, of course, many other examples, right? I could list a whole stretch across all the different stages. But I think at the end of the day, right, if you have an understanding of their win, if you're building trust and credibility and you're making them look like a hero, that's the secret ingredient to building a champion and having success in a sales cycle. Extremely well said. And I really appreciate it. Love the examples. I want to ask you about one concept that you brought up a couple of times that I think is really interesting. You said originally when it comes to the champion. Who is the champion? You're developing the champion and you're testing the champion. And you just mentioned in that big deal that you had tested your champion multiple times. Can you explain what that actually is? So if I were to describe it in one word, testing your champion essentially means making them audible ready. Do they take you to other people? Are they adopting the value proposition of your product within meetings? Are they connecting the dots for others? Are they helping to improve your position within the account? And there's different activities that you can execute at every single stage to ensure that you're constantly testing them. But the ultimate point you need to get to is that your champion is vocalizing their intent to own the success and outcomes of the project. Mm -hmm. And I think this is, can be both shared from the SE and the AE, is if someone says, hey, I love this, right? This is great, this is gonna help me. The next level question is, well, tell me how. What specifically is gonna help you? What do you love yeah. about it? And once you start getting down deeper into sort of the motivations, and as we've talked about now many times, the personal win, that's how you mm -hmm. test your champion, right? You sort of get mm -hmm. them so they have a vicarious connection between you and the product, and they are vocalizing yeah. the need and intent of bringing this product on board to everyone around them. 
something that you mentioned earlier is sometimes you might find the wrong champion, right? You might have someone who's all about your product, but they do not know how to get the deal done. And I think a lot of times what I've experienced in my own sales cycles in the past is that we had a champion, but they were the wrong champion. We had to go find a new champion that was above that person. So how do you do that effectively without destroying that relationship or essentially making that person say, oh, well, they went around me in my business. But that happens all the time, right? And I think it's super interesting as you talk about testing the champion and opening those doors, because that's really what it's about to get to the top of the organization to make a decision. This is something that I learned through failure, right? I think that's really mm-hmm. important. Many organizations will acquire software by committee. So they'll actually have to come in with an investment thesis, the expected ROI. They'll have to go to senior leadership and they'll say, here's the software we want to purchase. Here's what we expect the outcomes will be. And usually the question that the investment committee is going to ask them is, are you personally signing up for it? Who's going to own this? So the idea of testing the champion for me really became quite clear because we had an example with a pharmaceutical company when I was an early IC where we had done all the prep, everything looked great on paper, but we had not tested the champion. So when she went into the firing line, Mm -hmm. she actually retracted her statement. So we ended up losing that deal. Now, fast forward two years, we ended up getting that account, but that was a huge learning experience for me is making them audible ready. That's why I would emphasize the audible ready part, asking them a question so that they can answer any question that someone else throws at them is absolutely Mm -hmm. critical. Andrew, I feel like I could spend another 45 minutes asking about champion building. This is a really great topic, I think, for anybody who's in the role or a leader. So I want to close with an advice question. What advice do you have for especially the leaders that are listening that don't have a strong point of view on having their SCs own a portion of champion building? My personal perspective is that your best and most experienced SCs are likely already naturally doing a lot of this, right? They're already developing champions within sales cycles. I think what's incumbent for the SE leadership team is you should identify these SEs early and understand what activities and tools are already being used to build champions and what activities and tools do they need to be trained on or be given to improve that practice. I think understanding what success stories have they had, who are they developing as champions, what learnings can we spread throughout the organization is critical as a first starting block. The next thing, and we haven't touched on this yet, but I think it's very important, is you need to talk to your sales counterparts and develop a plan and a shared responsibility model on how you actually build a champion. If you have a clear plan in place with each account and understand the appropriate swim lanes for both the SE and AE to play, you're going to broaden your reach across both the business and IT. And once an SE has established that champion, developed a relationship, we have to ensure that there's a mutual flow of information so we can triangulate the facts and expose gaps in the account strategy. And just having simple guardrails that will prevent internal conflict from manifesting. We didn't touch on that before, but I think that's a very important point is making sure that your sales counterparts are aligned to the activity of champion building. We don't want to create friction within the team. You know, the last thing I would say is build a culture in which SEs have ownership and accountability now to a deal. So as I said earlier, right, at Salonis, we've infused into our team culture this structural aspect, such as variable comp and operating cadence. But you don't need to start there. You can have SEs get involved in deals early. You can encourage and reward behavior, which leads to champion building. For example, simply in celebrating like an SE on department all hands who have developed champions and using that as the shining beacon on the hill can go a long way. So it doesn't really matter how mature or early stage your SE org is, there are opportunities to embed this type of behavior like within your corporate DNA. So I would highly encourage everyone to start that process or look at very simple starting block ways to initiate that. Andrew, so well said. Congratulations on all your success and the team's success at Salonis. It's an awesome and inspirational journey to hear. And I really appreciate your time today. What a great topic. My pleasure. Great talking with you, James. All right, Pre-Sales Collective, that was a fun episode. I have so many more questions I would love to ask Andrew. I really appreciate his perspective about how he and Salonis are approaching sales and approaching champion building with the solutions team. We continue to talk about these types of subjects and topics because we want to continue to elevate the role of solutions. Solutions professionals need to take on more accountability in the sales process. We need to be looked at as true co-pilots in driving strategy. We can't just be the technical experts anymore. This role is evolving to be more. I believe the concept of champion building is something that we all can be better at. And as you heard from Andrew's experience today, building those champions that can sell on your behalf. They are individuals who can go and answer questions and help your technology be 
sold within an organization without you being there. With how sales has become so multi-threaded, it is so important for our solutions team to help play a role in champion building, have other champions beyond who the account executives have or who the sales leaders have. You can hear from Andrew's tone how business-minded he is and how that holds true to his organization. But as we talk about how pivotal and integral the solutions team is to deals, you can hear that they are true partners in strategy. They're involved in forecasts. They're involved in account overviews. They play an integral role to deals getting closed. Andrew even said, deals can't close without a solutions professional. So I love that there's a culture of accountability. I love that we're putting a little bit more from the business perspective on the solutions professional and having them play an integral role in deal closures and revenue generation. All right, Pre-Sales Collective, I hope you saw our announcement about our fall back to school tour. We hope to see you on the tour, whether at a local event or our Leader Elevate workshops. Also, you can sign into the member hub, see the upcoming events, both virtually and in person. And you can also join our connections platform to meet other solutions professionals around the globe. All right, Pre-Sales Collective, I'll see you next week.